for sure. Let me um, hold on, share this really quick. Show up for me, beautiful, beautiful. Cool, okay. Okay, cool. Y'all can see that. Looks like a this this one. You can see this full screen. Okay, cool. Let me play it. My name is Javier, and I'm from Guatemala. Garrett? So I came here with my mom and my brother one day after my sixth birthday, but I remember that day very clearly, like it was just yesterday. I actually hadn't seen this photo for a really long time. I forgot it existed, but <laughs> this was the day after we immigrated, making the snow angel. I didn't realize that we were undocumented what that truly meant until maybe like three years later when I wasn't really allowed to. Let me swap these. United States. So what had happened was, I guess I must have just been a very queer kid that everybody kind of picked up on it when I was very young. My mother realized there wasn't something that was going to go away. There just came a point where my mom decided we can't stay in this country. It's not safe for my family. It's not safe for me. And so she made the sacrifice to come to the U.S. This is the day that my mom graduated from university. I'm, I'm actually in this photo. <laughs> you can't see me, but um, my mom was always super, super smart, much smarter than I am. And it wasn't easy for her to graduate from university and then give all of that up so that I could have a, a normal childhood and be able to marry who I love eventually and lead the most authentic version of myself. My mother still to this day is um, a housekeeper. I think it is very difficult to be queer in the Latino community. There's violence against um, LGBTQ people. I can't imagine all of the people who are facing deportation now, how they're gonna face going back to the, that hatred. When I realized that Trump would be our next president, my first thoughts didn't go to all of the bigotry and all of the racism that we still face in this country. It went to all of the good people who helped my family and I. I think it's totally reasonable to be afraid. I think that they should feel uh, assured that there are a lot of people like myself um, who are now legal and who are conscious of the fact that our undocumented brothers and sisters are still suffering and are willing to stand up for them. I think something that um, American people can do to help um, alleviate some of the anxieties and worries of their undocumented friends is to just be there for them. I think more valuable than anything is just letting people know that you care about them and that you're willing to uh, use the privilege that you have as an American citizen to fight for them. actually extra sensitive um, for myself at least today um, knowing that the election is next week um, and part of I think his call to action um, and in line with y'all what y'all are talking about is how do we create safe spaces for folks um, especially with such multi-layered identities and and um, what he's naming out is really just listening for people seeing them um, caring for them um, and, and I, I'm going to add to that believing them. Um, and that's part of, let me stop this really quick. That's part of CORE's mission too, is really believing people um, when they say what's going on in their lives. Because part of abuse is um, not believing you, changing your truth, 
um, creating new truth for you. So yeah, the mo one of the most powerful things we can do is actually believe people. Um, uh, let me stop my slideshow really quick because I want to do some basic uh, uh, information or psycho ed. Let me show this one. Okay. Um, so just to give you a, more of an overview of what abuse is generally, um, and then we'll get into the intersection for LGBTQ folks. Um, relationship abuse, um, and you'll hear me use these terms interchangeably, intimate partner abuse, relationship abuse, and domestic violence. They all mean the same thing. Um, it is a pattern of behaviors and a pattern of behaviors used to gain and maintain power and control over an intimate partner. An intimate partner means that someone that you are interested in dating. So that means someone you were, it could be someone that you were just talking to on a dating app or online because you wanted to meet up with them and date and talk um, more. It doesn't mean that you have to be married or in a long-term relationship. Um, it could, there's a lot of dating violence. Um, and we're noticing that, especially with a lot of stalking um, and, and cyber stalking. And that does not mean it's not intimate partner violence, even though you've just been casually talking. Um, and then also abuse, um, just the definition here, um, is power and control. Um, we talked a little bit last time about what power is. We have social power, which is like the power to influence people. Um, there's like physical power, um, which is like, you know, right, like actually over a body. Um, we have uh, political power, which is like the power um, over like our government and the power to influence legislation and uh, economic power, which is like power over resources. So power over, power over um, plus control equals abuse. So if someone has power over you and uses that power to control you, um, that and over time, right? Like a pattern of it is what how we understand intimate partner abuse. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> So different ways that shows up, um, it's physical abuse, which is one of the biggest ways that people uh, cue into abuse and violence. Um, and that's any sort of, any sort of physical um, violence done to someone's body um, or even the threat of it. They don't have to hit you. It could be they threaten or intimidate you to make you feel like something could happen to your body. Um, so hitting, slapping, pushing, kicking, punching, um, strangulation, restricting or blocking you from leaving a room or the house, uh, destroying objects in front of a partner, because uh, essentially what that is doing, it's, it's not just the physical act of throwing things, but it's, it's intimidating you, right? Like it's, a, it's threatening um, someone to feel like something could happen to their body, um, threatening with a weapon, um, reckless driving, sleep deprivation, um, using weapons, obviously murdering somebody, and then injuring pets actually too. Um, a lot of uh, abuse happens when uh, someone tries to harm a pet, especially um, like a support animal uh, that might, uh, is often a tactic of abuse. Um, however, one of the biggest <coughs> way, uh, biggest tactic of abuse that we see at Cora um, that I think a lot of people have also witnessed is verbal and emotional abuse. Some people uh, talk this one down too. They say it's not so bad. Everybody yells. Everybody um, puts each other down. And no, not everybody does that. Um, but that also, just because a lot of people do it, does not make it okay, um, and does not make uh, diminish the effects. So we could feel um, really destroyed um, by verbal emotional abuse. And what we see at Cora too is that healing from verbal Emotional abuse um, actually takes more time um, than healing from physical abuse. Um, so verbal emotional abuse, yelling, insults, humiliation, blaming, isolation, jealousy, accusations, possessiveness, <clears throat> threatening to out somebody using kids, uh, like threatening to turn someone into authorities, like um, if like, especially ICE, like people with, um, undocumented status um, that is often used as a tactic of abuse um, and threatening to commit suicide. Um, so some less known ones are spiritual abuse, so den essentially denying someone um, their right to worship or ridiculing their beliefs. Um, financial abuse is controlling money and decisions, maybe even having secrets 
about money, um, harassing a partner at work, or uh, sabotaging your work or school. So sometimes a partner will show up to your class and make a scene, and then you can't focus. Obviously, that's that's a, a, a larger form. It's a more of a public form of abuse. But even not letting you do your homework, um, maybe not letting you go to class, um, that's actually a, a, a form of abuse. Uh, what I was alluding to too, stalking and harassing. So act, physically following, appearing at your uh, someone's workplace or residence, um, entering personal property. Uh, and, and one of the biggest ones is repeatedly contacting or threatening by phone, email, text, social networking. So blowing up your phone. Um, some, some people say they get like a hundred texts from their partner just or say why aren't you answering the phone you have to answer the phone where are you i can see you on your you know, track my phone um i i know where you are blah 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 um social abuse let's see i got a chat yeah for sure um social abuse uh, using blackmail <clears throat> to control a partner's actions threatening or actually spreading rumors about a partner Isolating a partner from their friends and family. One of the biggest indications of abuse is if you, your your friend um, isn't hanging out with you anymore. Um, and it might seem really fun, like they're really caught up with their partner at first, um, but it 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 actually is a is a form of isolating someone so that they don't talk to their partner or to their friends, to their family members. Maybe getting in in between your friendships. Um, yeah just so that they don't have anybody to talk to. Um, they don't have anybody to trust to talk about what's going on or to, to escape. Um, Cyberbullying and using religion and culture to trap a partner in the relationship. We also see this a lot um, because people don't know how, what to do. People don't know that there are other options, especially when their family, their community um, kind of sanctions abuse meaning that it's so common in our culture, it's so common in our religion. Um, like, like, let's say uh, divorce is really looked up, down upon in your religion. Like, how could you possibly leave your partner um, if your family says, oh, you know, that's just how relationships are sometimes. Um, you know, it's, well, we see this a lot in heterosexual relationships. Um, you know, men are just supposed to have, you know, control over the household. You really just got to do what he says. And when you get in line, um, things will be better. That's what a wife is supposed to do. Um, there's so many cultures that have that um, way of viewing relationships. So it can be very hard to stay in line with your culture, like because that might, your community and your culture is important to you while also keeping yourself safe um, and, and holding on to your confidence and your self-worth is really hard. Um, and then sexual abuse, um, while it is a form of physical abuse, it, it really does have its own category because um, this really does damage people or really affect people in such severe ways. Um, and that is any unwanted sexual activity. Um, consent is, uh, at, you know, a verbal or very em emphatic uh, yes to sexual activity. Um, and that can be any sort of touch, right? Like, let's say uh, someone is touching your knee in a, a way that you don't want. Um, and someone touching your body or alluding to that, saying any sort of unwanted comments, uh, gestures, references, maybe showing you a video that's sexually explicit, you didn't ask for that. Um, all of that is sexual abuse. And really want to stress too, that just because you're in a relationship, even if you're married to someone, does that, that does not mean that you are, that is consent for all times, always. You still gotta say yes, you still have to want it. Um, spousal rape um, was uh, created as a law in like 1993. So like there are still ways um, that legally you can stay safe and find representation for those kinds of acts. Um, but yeah, so basically all of these things are, people shouldn't be doing things to you that make you feel bad um, and that you don't want. Um, and that's really confusing too if we we don't have these kinds of, if we haven't been taught this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop this one and then really briefly show you one more and then I'll go back to the slideshow. This is uh, the cycle of violence. Um, 
which basically uh, talks about that violence happens in a cycle or abuse happens in a cycle. It doesn't just all happen at once. Um, when you enter into a relationship with somebody, it's not that they are abusive, abusive right from the get-go, um, that you know that that's going to happen to you. Why would we be in those relationships, right? Um, often they're really wonderful relationships at first. Um, a lot of people who are harmful or in act abuse are very charming um, and really like romantic and personable as you're getting to know them. Um, so we call that the honeymoon stage. Um, it's just really these warm feelings, people really doing a lot um, to make you feel good. Um, and then tension builds. Um, in any relationship, tension can build, right? Um, but this is like minor incidents, like criticizing, yelling, blaming. Um, the survivor, the person um, surviving the abuse or harm feels like they're walking on eggshells. They're really doing a lot um, to keep their partner at ease. Always feels like they can prevent the abuse, right? That at the end of the day, they feel responsible kind of for the tension that's happening. Um, and often that's because the person causing harm is making them, is either explicitly saying or making them feel like uh, they are the reason. Um, they are the reason they are to blame. So then that moves to the explosive phase. This is when abuse occurs, like an actual major incident. Um, and, and that's on that, the types I showed you. It could be any of those. When um, sexual assault happens, um, physical assault, uh, emotional abuse, um, and uh, it depends on the type of relationship, what's been going on over time. And as it says here, typically it does get worse over time. So maybe the incidents of abuse early on in the relationship are less severe and then they start to escalate. Um, so essentially the person causing harm is out of control, uh, can terrorize the survivor for hours, breaks things, um, hitting, choking, or excuse me, strangle, strangling someone, burning, tying someone up, raping or kicking someone. Um, the survivor survives a stage often with physical injuries or emotional injuries um, and can end up in the hospital. Sometimes the police are called, not always by the survivor, sometimes neighbors hear um, what's going on and they might call. Um, sometimes the children in the house call the police because they're really scared. Um, yeah, so this is where an incident happens. And after the incident, always what follows um, is some sort of reconciliation. We often call this the gaslighting stage. This is where the person who causes harm apologizes, begs the survivor to believe that the violence won't happen again. And, and blames the survivor for the abuse. And it's, it's so subtle. Essentially what happens is, I'm so sorry. I was so out of control. I didn't mean to do that. It will never happen again. But you know, if you, if you didn't do X, Y, Z, that wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, if dinner had just been ready when I gotten home, I, I, wouldn't have lost, um, I wouldn't have lost my cool like that. And I wouldn't have yelled at you. I wouldn't have broken that plate. You know, if, if you had just been home on time, I, I don't understand. Um, but I won't do it again. It's so subtle, right? Like the kind of shifting. It seems like they're taking accountability, but actually they're not. They're still pushing that back onto the survivor. Um, often the survivor too is really in shock after what happened, especially if you know some some sort of physical or sexual violence happens. People are in shock. Like they don't know that that could have happened. They can't believe it. So they're very vulnerable. Um, to, this, uh, to the apologizing and to accepting the blame. Um, yeah, false resolution, really a lot of denial and minimizing life goes on. Um, sometimes a person causing harm might encourage the survivor to go do fun things, go be with their family, maybe do the thing um, that they were controlling um, before. Uh, so, you know, I don't like it so much when you hang out with your friends. Uh, but now I'm really going to encourage you to hang out with your friends so you can get this high after feeling a trauma after experiencing abuse. It can be this this weird high that happens um, from this apologizing reconciliation phase, um, which then leads back to honeymoon. And the survivor essentially feels like things won't happen again. Um, and then it happens again. <laughs> Tension always builds in the way that the relationship learns to release that tension is through abuse. Um, yeah, and, and I think, well, not I think, what we have seen is that these periods can also, especially earlier in the relationship, be a lot longer. So the honeymoon phase might take 
a lot, a long time, could be years really. And it feels like it's so great, but tension still starts to build. Maybe tension lasts a long time and, and then there's still abuse. Um, so just because there's these long periods doesn't necessarily mean that the cycle has been broken. Um, it just means that things take different amounts of time. Um, as we see though, as the relationship goes forward and the longer you're in that relationship, the shorter uh, the period in each phase. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that one. And please, yes, feel free to ask questions. This, in the Slido, um, Alvin's paying attention to that as well as in the chat here. You're more than welcome to ask any questions. Um, so, <laughs> let me go back to the slideshow. Uh, let me see. We got a, we got a question, Jenna. Oh, shoot. What's the question? Um, can the cycle of violence be broken? Totally, totally. It can be broken a lot of different ways. Um, one of the ways we see um, e easier, more obvious is that people leave the relationship. Um, but you can also still be having that kind of cycle in yourself. You can be drawn um, unconsciously to those dynamics. Um, and we see that especially for um, like children who've witnessed violence um, can be unconsciously drawn. It's not that they're nice and that we want them, but that we're fam it's familiar. Um, maybe we had a parent who was very charming um, and made us feel a particular way, um, but was also abusive to our other parent. Um, so we might feel really drawn to that person. Um, and how does the cycle of violence actually end is the person who causes harm takes actual accountability actual accountability. So not shifting, being like, I'm so sorry. I'm really out of control. I need help. I'm going to go get help. And that they get the help because they want to change. Um, not because the court is making them, not because they're in jail and they really want you to drop the charges, but because really they, they want that for themselves. Um, and you see them really take full accountability and not shift the blame onto the survivor. Um, yeah, and it takes a lot of healing, um, but it's possible. Yeah, that's why uh, agencies like CORE exist. Um, that's the work we do actually to, to help families end those cycles for sure. I hope that answers that question. It's a process though, for sure. It's, it's, and especially because I think our society is in a perpetual cycle of violence. Um, so that can be hard to break in our cultural community awareness. Um, yeah. All right, let me share this again. You can see that, right? It's the video that we showed before. Perfect. Okay, so, um, so I wanna move into this. The personal is political. I'm sure you've heard that before and people have their feelings about it. But I really believe it, um, especially as we're talking about violence, intimate partner abuse. So whether we're talking about power and control within an intimate relationship or within the whole of the United States society, we see the same dynamics used to maintain an equal distribution of power, control, and access to resources. Um, so I'm going to move to this one. And this is... Um, um, uh, open for a chat, so um, people are welcome to unmute themselves if they have um, answers or also to type them into the chat box. Um, but the question is, so how do we see uh, these types of dynamics, how we were uh, briefly going over in the types of rela relationships of use, how do we see these show up on a collective societal level and an intimate, interpersonal level? Um, and I'll give an example, but I really want to um, hear from the group. Um, so using physical and sexual violence. Um, one way that shows up on the individual level is literally like punching somebody or uh, uh, any type of sexual assault. So like non-consensual sexual activity, how that happens on a collective society. Um, genocide, physical violence is like genocide, um, murdering a group of people based off of their uh, ethnic or cultural identity. Um, and yeah, I, that's one example. <laughs> Does anyone have one for this? For using physical or sexual violence? 
you can also name out if you if you um there's like a particular incident like so i said genocide like the armenian genocide um or the holocaust Anybody have any thoughts? Um, I've seen um, uh, folks in relationships where it gets physical, um, where they say it's because like, oh, I'm very like invested in, like I'm very just passionate about mm -hmm. our relationship and it drives me to, you know, I've become like very overwhelmed and and this is what happens, at least from like my experiences with um, folks who see that they they kind of use their like emotions and or lack thereof to control them as a way to justify um, their action. Totally, totally. So so naming kind of <clears throat> how this shows up that people can can name that they're very passionate, they're very emotionally engaged, and sometimes they get out of control, and that's that's why an incident of physical abuse has happened. Sure. Um, I see in the chat Priscilla naming out um, emotional abuse on the interpersonal level can be passive aggressive. Yeah, for sure. Um, manipulating victims' emotions. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, on a collective societal level, uh, let's see, how do you manipulate someone's emotion or be passive aggressive? Uh, we could say something is a person's fault, I hear. Um, you know, uh, um, to minimize police brutality or to minimize violence then um, to uh, Black folks, African-American folks, they're like, well, they have higher rates of Black-on-Black -black crime. Like, why don't we talk about that? Like, oh my God, talk about emotional abuse and like not, and minimizing, denying, blaming, not taking any accountability. Um, for societal abuse by just shoving a different reason to the forefront. Um, I think about for sure the US-Mexico border and the trauma being inflicted upon children being separated from their parents. Yes, that's one that's using children that's psychological, emotional abuse to both parties. It's physical um, violence to both parties. Um, isolation, that's actually a, a lot of these forms of abuse is what we're doing to families at the border, it's horrendous. Um, is someone trying to be better than the other to constantly make them feel less of a person considered abuse as well? Yeah, like, like um, we would see that as a form of a psychological, emotional abuse, like always putting someone down um to make you to make themselves feel better um like if i feel insecure um <clears throat> about my intelligence my academic performance i might say everybody in my class is stupid like they don't understand things as well as i do like i'm such a wonderful writer um you're such a um, awful writer something like that definitely we, I actually now think of that, we see that in our politics right now, there's a lot of putting themselves up um, and putting other people in the government down to maybe make themselves feel better. And that is a form of abuse. Um, maybe one or two more questions or comments or examples and we'll move, we'll move on. Folks also purposely wearing, saying, triggering things uh -huh, in order to like instigate stuff, um, maybe in order to make sure that people know uh, that they don't um, value certain people or certain ideas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, if anybody has more examples, they're more than welcome to continue to put them in the chat, um, but we'll keep moving on. Um, or if you have any questions, like if you're not sure, um, 
please put those in too and can help clarify. Okay, so we're gonna move um, specifically to intimate partner violence and abuse um, in LGBTQ relationships. Um, so I wanted to start first with a, a birdcage metaphor um, that was put out by Marilyn Fry. Um, and she talks about abuse being a birdcage. Um, right, consider a birdcage. If you look very closely at just one wire in the cage, you cannot see the other wires. If your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus, the singular focus, you could look at that one wire up and down the length of it and be unable to see why a bird would not just fly around the wire anytime it wanted to go somewhere. Furthermore, even if one day at a time, you myopically inspected each wire, you still could not see why a bird would have trouble going past the wires to get anywhere. There's no physical property of any one wire, nothing that the closest scrutiny could discover that will reveal how a bird can be inhibited or harmed by it, except in the most um, accidental way. It is only when you step back, stop looking at the wires one by one and take a macroscopic view of the whole cage that you can see why the bird does not go anywhere. And then you will see it in a moment. It will require, require no great subtlety of mental powers. It is perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded by a network of systemically related barriers. No one of which would be at least hindrance to its flight, but which by the relations to each other are as confining as the solid walls of a dungeon. It is now possible to understand uh, one reason why oppression can be hard to see and recognize. One can study the elements of an oppressive structure with great care and goodwill without seeing the structure as a whole and hence without seeing or being able to understand that one is looking at a cage and that there are people who are caged, whose motion and mobility are restricted, whose lives are shaped, are shaped and reduced by the cage. Um, so I really appreciate this way of understanding abuse because it's not just one thing. Um, often people can get really caught up. Why doesn't she leave? Why do, why do they stay in that relationship? But we can't see how many different things are holding someone in, a, in an abusive relationship, in an abusive community even. Um, it's our own singular view, our own misunderstanding of seeing their whole lives in context that we can't understand why they can't um, get out of that relationship or do something different in that relationship. So just being careful when um, when you hear of somebody experiencing um, abusive dynamics, to not say that to them. Um, that that's not how we can be powerful allies and friends um, to people who are um, suffering from abuse. Um, one of the best ways we can do is, how can I help you? What's going on? I believe you. I see you. And helping them find resources that make sense for them. Um, Okay, so some quick uh, statistics. Um, so 53.8% of lesbian women and 61.1% of bisexual women have experienced rape, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lives, as opposed to 35% of heterosexual women. We see actually the highest rates of intimate partner abuse um, is directed towards bisexual women, a lot of times by men or um, people who identify as male. 26% uh, of gay men and 37.3% of bisexual men have experienced rape, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime in comparison to 29% of heterosexual men. Um, only 26% of men in same-sex relationships called the police for assistance after experiencing near lethal violence, so almost dying. Um, only 26% of men uh, actually call the police. And that's for a whole bunch of reasons, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, in 2012, fewer than 5% <clears throat> of uh, LGBTQ survivors of intimate partner violence sought or orders of protection. So really what we're seeing is that LGBTQ folks do not um, call the police. They do not seek out uh, legal representation, go to court. Um, really high rates of keeping it to themselves. Um, of keeping it to themselves, yeah. Uh, transgender victims or survivors are more likely to experience intimate partner violence in public 
compared to those who do not identify as transgender, meaning that not only do they have higher rates of abuse, but they have higher rates of people being willing to abuse them in public, but they do not care. They don't think anything's wrong with that um, versus like um, people who don't identify as transgender. Um, naming out bisexual victims are more likely to experience sexual violence compared to people um, who are not. Um, LGBTQ, Black, and African-American survivors are more likely to experience physical intimate partner violence compared to those who do not identify as Black or African-American. LGBTQ uh, white survivors are more likely to report experiences of sexual violence compared to those who do not identify as white. Um, so that being that white folks are more likely to call the police than, than people who don't identify as white. Uh, LGBTQ victims on public assistance are more likely to experience intimate partner violence compared to those who are not on public assistance. Um, and that uh, goes for um, undocumented folks too. Actually, they are more likely to experience and not involve the police um, when they experience intimate partner violence. And 21 to 55 percent, um, I dropped the LGBTQ. Um, LGBTQ Asian women have experienced intimate partner and or sexual violence. Um, and these are all statistics that you can find online. Um, it's on the National Coalition for Domestic Violence. Um, this is a power and control wheel for lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual relationships. And essentially, this is all the different um, ways that abuse shows up, you know, how we were going over the types of relationship abuse. Um, this is just a, um, more specific to these types of relationships. Um, the things that mostly, the things that are really different um, are uh, entitlement, uh, transphobia, homo or biphobia, heterosexism, um, and HIV related abuse. Um, and I, these are all, they all have different characteristics. Um, so part of heterosexism overall is just the, the, the fear and the oppression that exists for our cult, in our culture and our society at large is essentially showing up and being used as a tactic for abuse in the, in the relationship. Um, so using awareness of fear and hatred of LGBTQ folks to convince a partner of danger and reaching out to others. So you can't reach out to other people. You can't say anything ab about this. No one's gonna believe you anyways, because you're queer. Um, no one's gonna do anything because nobody helps LGBTQ folks. Um, what we've also noticed too is like, you know, a lot of people are in these relationships um, as a, well, as a result of not maybe being in their homes, maybe have been, um, experienced a lot of hatred from their families, um, and maybe this is the one person who accepts them in their identity and, and their sexual orientation. Um, and what we also notice too um, is that LGBTQ folks are more likely to resist or to fight back. Um, so everything on this wheel can be used to commit abuse or to survive it. Um, so you can um, break a plate, right, like to threaten your partner, to intimidate them, but it can also be after your, when your partner is yelling at you and harassing you and making you feel awful, you might throw that plate to make the abuse stop. Um, and it can get really tricky. Uh, a lot of times there's more allegations for mutual abuse for LGBTQ folks. Um, survivors get locked up a lot alongside their, um, their abuser. And just the dynamics are really awful and traumatizing. Um, are there any questions on this? I got one from this slide. Please. Um, how do you support someone who is in an abusive relationship, but it is part of their, their culture or their religion? For sure. Um, so person-centered, asking them what they need, um, asking them what kind of support they want. Oftentimes people just want to hear you out, um, naming maybe that there are other options, saying that, you know, um, you could talk to an agency, um, and you don't have to be in that relationship, um, and seeing how they react to that. Uh, do they get really scared? Um, then maybe that's not an option. Um, helping them stay safe in their relationship. So if leaving the relationship isn't an option, and their partner is physically abusive, um, 
maybe you can help them strategize ways to stay safe when their partner is being physically abusive. Can you leave the house in those moments? Um, don't lock yourself um, in the bathroom or in a room without a window. Um, don't be in a room with sharp objects. Like, um, don't go into the kitchen if your partner is really upset, because uh, that's how pe often people get accidentally, accidentally, um, how uh, larger rates of abuse happen or physical abuse happen because there was access to a weapon, like a, a knife, um, just because it's on the counter or on the knife block. So helping them strategize um, ways to stay safe in their home, um, if they can have a bag, a takeaway bag, um, that has their keys and all their important documents that they can hide. Um, you still talk to them. You know, you don't ever make your friendship uh, an ultimatum. It, it happens a lot. Like people are like, I don't want to be around this partner. I can't see my friend being ridiculed. Like it hurts me to see them like this. But man, they lose friends left and right. And then, it, then they be, lose hope and they lose people who do make them feel good. So helping people feel good about themselves, remind them about their strengths. Um, because the more and more they feel good about themselves, the less they're gonna put up with abuse. Um, I hope that answered that question. Um, yeah, I, I wanna name too that uh, isolation is a big part of this. 49% of LGBTQ youth say they have an adult in their family they can turn to for help if they feel worried or sad, whereas 79% um, of non-LGBTQ youth say the same. So um, cisgendered heterosexual youth have more adults in their lives that they trust, um, that they uh, feel comfortable with. Um, so sometimes people end up in abusive relationships because of that, honestly. Um, they're kicked out of their homes. Like I've mentioned, they've been ridiculed and they feel awful about themselves already um, because of what their families, their communities, their culture, our society tell them about themselves. They think that this is what they deserve and the best they can get. Um, part of that is also where are the re representations of healthy queer relationships. Um, what I've experienced as a queer person myself is that there's lots of stories about really traumatic relationships um, that their relationship really has to struggle just to exist. Um, so there's all this trauma. So we think all that's all there is, like that there's just these traumatic, really stressful relationships. Um, but there, there are routes to healthy relationships. They do exist. Trust me, really, they do exist. Um, and we just need to see more of that representation in our media and our communities. Um, I'm going to move on from this one. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of the differences and similarities um, for all abusive relationships, power and control drives the abuse. Um, the differences for LGBTQ folks is the specific tactics change, like outing, using homophobia, transphobia, biphobia. Um, I had a client who <clears throat> their partner uh, was mad at them for something, was essentially trying to blackmail them, and then outed them to their family, who was a really uh, Catholic um, Mexican American family, and they kicked <laughs> they kicked her out of her house, and her partner basically was like, "See, you know, if you had just done what I told you to, I wouldn't have to do that." And they just destroyed this person's life, like outrageous. Okay, um, similarities: survivor may feel isolated, powerless, believe the abuse is their fault. Abuse can be all the types. Um, relieving leaving the relationship can be difficult and dangerous. Um, isolation, using children, using small communities, alcohol and drug abuse are often a part of that. Um, I have these little asterisks because they show up different for LGBTQ folks too. LGBTQ communities are really small. So imagine if you're the person that you just broke up with, your abuser is just embedded in all the systems and organizations around you. How can you go out to the club when you know that your uh, ex-partner could be there? Um, or all your friends know that person and you don't want to necessarily put your business out into the public, um, but then you keep ending up in situations where your, your former abusive partner shows up. Um, and alcohol and drug abuse are really an issue for the LGBTQ community because 
yo, that's where we meet people is at bars. Like some of the first places that people come out are at uh, gay bars, your spaces. Um, so they're just higher rates of drug and alcohol abuse um, also as a part of the stress of being LGBTQ. Um, some of the differences, fear of re-victimization by law enforcement, criminal justice system, and social service workers. Um, if anybody recently has noticed that Texas now is allowing social service workers to discriminate against LGBTQ folks and not provide services to them. Um, so people legit have legitimate fears about going to institutions for help. Um, there's limited awareness of relationship abuse in LGBTQ communities. Sometimes people be like, oh no, that's for straight people. Like we don't do that. <laughs> um, fear that abuse may not be taken seriously due to heterosexism. Part of that's like, well, you, you know, you're gay. Like what did you expect was gonna happen? Um, fear that abuse will be blamed on sexual orientation or gender identity, exactly. Um, accusations of mutual abuse, which I was talking about before. Um, leveraging institutional violence and isolation, um, sometimes bisexual women, like their former um, heterosexual male partner might say that uh, they won't let them have their kids um, because they're gay or because they're having a gay relationship. So they want to take the kids away, um, form of abuse and lack of civil legal protections. Okay. Um, Homelessness rates are also really high for LGBTQ youth in particular, and being together, being in a relationship, uh, abusive relationship can be uh, a source for financial security, um, which would be very difficult to manage. Um, they know that the relationship is really harmful, but that might be the only way that they stay off the street. Um, yeah. And it's really hard if your uh, partner is the only one who validates your queerness or your identity. Okay, I'm going to play this. See if it'll do automatically. Nope. Okay. I identify as um, gender queer and queer. Queer, dirty queer, cisgendered woman, trans person who's gay, lesbian, and a woman. Middle aged gay male. <laughs> I was in an abusive relationship for about nine years. It was my first relationship. I really did not see it as abuse because domestic violence had always been sold to me as, you know, a heterosexual man hitting a, a heterosexual woman. I was in a dominant submissive relationship um, and we'd negotiated that, that boundary, but it, it kind of crossed over and became very emotionally abusive. Um, my partner at the time was a, a trans man. He was very controlling, very manipulative, financially abusive. There were a few incidents of physical abuse. Domestic violence in my life was in a previous identity or form, and it was with a woman, and I experienced 10 years of domestic violence, which was very much uh, psychological violence and physical violence. My experiences of family violence started from a young age. I come from a split family. My younger sibling and I moved uh, with my mother. She had another partner after my father and um, he was extremely violent. I've always had a gender expression of masculinity. I was definitely targeted by him. After six months I had uh, my, got my first broken bone. Um, there were a number of broken bones after that. It took me a long time to actually realise what was going on. My transition and my, my transgender status was used as a weapon. So I often got messages threatening to out me if I didn't do what I was told afterwards or if I'd not agreed with something that she'd said, she'd say, I'm going to out you or you deserve to be outed right now. And, and in the end, she did out me to my family and my, and my family are religious. And so uh, that was a really terrifying experience. And even right up until the end, it was still used. And it's part of the reason I don't have majority care of my children is because I'm transgender. I didn't have anywhere to go. I couldn't leave the house. Um, there was no um, shelters for single dads with children, uh, so I had to work my own way through it. I'm kind of the poster child for another closet website. As I was reading through 
kind of going, oh, that's exactly my life. Gee, that cycle of, uh, of violence really sounds very familiar. Gee, all of these things, I'm just ticking off every single one on this list. It was actually the very next day that I rang up some friends who had been supportive and had been kind of I like to say drawing circles around the whole thing for me for a long time. And I did a pack and dash. I was over and out. He actually pulled a necklace that I was wearing off my neck and in the process it cut all the way across the back of my neck quite deeply. And that argument finished with me actually on the floor begging for forgiveness for making him so angry. And I was thinking like, this is not who I am. This is not me. This is not right. This is not okay. I had the conversation with my friend at some point that I w couldn't really spend time with him anymore and he was really clear that at whatever point things changed that he would be there. You know, I relied on someone to actually you know help me get dressed, get me into the car, get me to Akon and kind of plop me in front of a intake person. The only time I have accessed external services was in my adult life and that was to process what had happened in my childhood. So for a long time, I believed that the problems were his alcohol abuse or, um, you know, his medication. I spent a lot of time thinking I was absolutely insane just because of the lies and manipulation that I was getting from this person. Sexuality at the time was very low on my priority list um, in terms of sorting that out and questioning it. It's like, I have no time to go through this turmoil over here. It's all this chaos over there that I need to sort with and getting through and surviving. I think it's really difficult um, once you've proclaimed to the world and you've overcome your own internal homophobia and you've fought against the, the, um, the prejudice to then um, admit that actually your relationship is is really toxic and and it's not a good relationship you know that that doesn't mean that you should have gone off and married a good mormon girl and 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 that the problem is your sexuality the problem is actually that abuse occurs um, in all kinds of relationships so what i would say to someone who's in a, a domestic violence situation or in a situation where they think it might be domestic violence but they're not sure um, I would say to trust your instincts. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. That the doubt stops being doubt when you leave. Always throw that lifeline out. It's, it's that moment where they feel empowered to grab it is the moment that they've, they're on their journey to survivorship. So I think services really need to become aware that um, toxic relationships happen in um, in, in all kinds of different scenarios, um, that uh, you know, domestic violence is about power, control, and abuse and manipulation, and that that's that's not just about um, uh, male to female um, physical violence; that it takes many different forms. My life's good after the end of that relationship. It took a while um, to kind of get myself back to to myself. I lost a lot of my own identity in that relationship because it became so about that other person. Um, for me now, my life is good. I have my kids in my care. I have a beautiful partner who I've been with for three years, I think. I am empowered to make my own decisions. So lots of love from my friends and, and partner. Do I look happy? <laughs> um, life is great. Life is fantastic. It's not good enough just to say we're welcoming and our service is open to everybody. Making your, your staff understand what the needs of LGBTIQ families might be, for example. So there are issues with children who need support. Um, their issues might be very, very different because they may have a different sort of family structure. It can also be things like making sure that your intake forms are, um, and processes are really accessible so that if there's a staff member sitting there with a person who's experienced violence, that you're using the right language so you can talk to people in the right way and make sure that you're building a relationship of trust. I think probably the most important thing is to be aware of what the services are that are out there that are able to offer specialist support. Um, so there are a number of different services, ACON included, the Inner City Legal Centre, those sorts of places who have projects which are specifically designed to help LGBTIQ people who've experienced violence in their relationships and are able to then um, connect them onto uh, the other mainstream support services as well.
No, you're not from Australia, for sure. Um, so I wanted to do a little bit of an activity um, <clears throat> in groups. People are willing. I'm going to just give, um, I'm just going to give one scenario if I can. I'll put it in the chat box and we'll all talk about it. Um, uh, so basically, this is um, talking a little bit about the uh, a similar scenario I was kind of alluding to earlier. Um, um, Marisol is a 16-year-old Mexican-American cis female who lives at home with her parents. Her white cis fam female partner outed Marisol to her family, which she wouldn't send her nude pictures. Um, Mary Soul was violently kicked out of her home by her dad and told that she wasn't allowed to return until she gave up her sinful lifestyle. Mary Soul just started her junior year of high school and is uncertain of where to go. She's asking you, her friend, to help her decide if she should move in with her girlfriend. Um, so this is some basic safety planning stuff. We're just going to go into breakout rooms and talk about like what we would ask Mary Soul, like how we would help her make a decision. Um, and it's okay to have uncomfortable thoughts or not know, um, but we're really here to just be in community to, to try and figure it out. 